Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Simon Crocker. I head up our SOC advisory services team um, for EMEA. Uh, we're a team of uh, consultants spread right across the region who help people plan, design, build, and optimize SOCs. Um, there's kind of two parts to this, this session. Um, I'm going to talk about SOC for about 45 minutes. And we've got Martin's going to come on, and he's going to talk about threat hunting, threat intelligence, and things like that. So four things I want to cover. Um, the first is an overview of SOC. Uh, what I want to get to here really is we see we've built lots of SOCs with people. We've, we've um, helped people optimize their SOCs, transform SOCs. So I want to introduce some of the, the challenges we see with SOC. Okay. Um, then we're going to talk about um, Cisco's approach to SOC, and how we build and, and plan SOCs. Um, and um, particularly the services that the SOCs may end up delivering. Um, we talk about SOC automation, so a big hot topic, and it touches on some of the things that James talked about earlier, um, automation in SOCs, and finally, SOC roadmap. How would you actually go about building a SOC and optimizing a SOC? So let's kick off, why, why would you even build a SOC in the first place? Why does, why does every customer I speak to seem to be building a SOC? Well, the easy answer to that is my job is to help people plan and build socks, but in general, lots more people are building socks. So I quite like this quote from, from John Chambers, our ex CSO. Um, CEO. Um, there are two types of organization those that have been hacked and those that don't know yet they've been hacked. And you're basically saying you are going to get hacked. Um, I've been doing cybersecurity for almost 20 years now in Cisco. Um, most of that time, security's been about protecting things, defending things. It's about building a, a hard perimeter around things, um, hardening things, defense in depth. Um, and five, six years ago, people, was, you know, people would say, well, what if someone gets in? We say, well, we won't get in because we'll just add more layers of security. As we saw some of the things earlier, um, people will get in. You know, someone with a, a, enough, enough time, enough money, enough resources will get into your, your network or systems. Um, so what do we do about it? So we need to monitor for this happening. So we need to collect data and telemetry and things from our networks and systems so we can, we can, we can monitor that. We need to detect that something has happened and we need to investigate that and react to it. And the people, the process, the tools that do that monitoring and investigation and, and, and response is generally called a SOC. So in a SOC, we've already, already mentioned people, process, and technology. What's most important? Which one of those three is most important? I have trouble seeing anybody with the lights. I'm seeing some shrugs. <laughs> What's that? I think this is quite important. People? Anybody else? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So and Martin and I might differ in our views on this. He might pick up. Um, to me, not one of those is more important than the others. Yeah, yeah. Maybe not necessarily one third, one third, one third. And different aspects of SOCs require different focuses on those pieces. But in essence, all three of those are required to run a successful SOC. Yeah, you can't have one without the other two. Don't take my word for it. It's got, got a quote here. It's quite old, but I quite like it. It's, it's 2017. So people are moving away from that prevention only. Security budgets are just on prevention only and looking at um, detection and response as well. Okay, so that's kind of what we are. Uh, you know, I say everybody seems to be building a stock. This is kind of like the, the way that the market is going or business is going. So what is a SOC? Okay, so there are actually multiple definitions of what a SOC is. Yeah, which is another way of saying there isn't really an de actual definition of a SOC. Yeah. Um, in fact, we don't even tend to call SOCs SOCs. Yeah. We're kind of stuck with this generic name that everybody uses. Um, comes from you know, Network Operations Center, Security Operations Center. But we're not really operating security here. So most people don't call their SOCs SOC. Um, they tend to be called all sorts of things. So a Cisco SOC is called CISA, Computer Security Instrument Response Team, of which kind of SOC is a part. Um, in Germany, my experience with German customers is they know exactly what to call a SOC. They call it a CDC, Cyber Defense Center. 
uh, you see Cyber Security Center, and I could put a whole list of 20 different names that people call this kind of thing that we, we call a SOC. Why does the name matter? Yeah. Well, the person who's paying for this, and SOCs generally cost millions of dollars to build and millions of dollars to run, whatever that name says, they'll think it what it does. Yeah? So if you say you're a cyber defense center and all you're really doing is monitoring things and reacting things, are you, really, are you really defending against it? Maybe not. So I spend a lot of time with, with people setting up these things in absolute agonies of deciding what they're going to call this thing. Yeah? And don't get me on to mission statements and vision statements. That's, that's even worse. Yeah. So yeah, even deciding what it's going to be called is, is difficult. So we're unsure about that. But what does a SOC actually do? OK. Does a SOC monitor things? I'm looking, hopefully, for some nod. I'm seeing lots of nods. Yeah, yeah. Does it investigate things? Yeah, yeah, more nods. Does it respond to things? Or does it escalate things? Can't really nod to that one. <laughs> I'm seeing some nods. <laughs> So SOCs in general don't usually respond to things themselves, yeah? So if I find, if I find the SOC finds malware on that computer, yeah, someone from the SOC doesn't generally get in a van, drive to site, wherever it is, go in the office, clear up the machine, and go back to the SOC. They usually escalate, and it's usually laterally in a SOC, escalate sideways to maybe the IT department, who will then get in a van and go and clear that laptop or whatever up. Does it inform or devise? Yeah. So when the SOC finds malware on this machine, or not even machine, malware on this IP address, does it just say to the IT department, malware found on this IP address? Yeah. Or does it say, malware found on this machine, this is an IP address, this is the person who owns it, this is the type of malware, this is the recommended way of dealing with it? Yeah. Does it hunt? Yeah, I'm not going to steal of any of Martin's thunder, but most socks would like to hunt. But hunting's difficult. Yeah. So we're now into the, you know, socks may or may not do these things. Does it manage platforms? So a sock is very likely to manage the core platforms it owns, the SIM and the TIP and the things like that. But does it manage firewalls? No, I'm hearing lots of no's, but we socks sometimes do. They don't want to do it. No one wants to manage firewalls. <laughs> but not even the firewall team. Does it provide security assurance? Who commissions pen tests? Who does vulnerability management? Could be the SOC. Yeah, it depends. So we've never seen two socks alike. Yeah, they're always doing something slightly different. And when you consider SOCs also outsource some of the stuff they do, you see totally different models. Yeah. So on to the challenges. Yeah. First, this is my big bugbear. Lots and lots and lots of SOCs fail because they were built bottom up. Yeah. So you might see a classic SOC. It was started off, the SOC started off as a, a syslog server in the corner of the NOC, and no one ever looked at. Then people start looking at it, and it turns into a SIM, and now they've got three people looking at that, that machine, and that's their SOC. Yeah. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's collecting what it can collect, not what the organization needs it to collect. So we were talking to the, the CISO, not last year, but the year before now, of one of the online gaming companies. And we, he was saying to us, well, our SOC, it, it just doesn't tell me what I need. We said, what are your, what are your main use cases? What, what keeps you up at night? He said, money laundering and identity fraud. Now, their SOC was collecting firewall logs. No amount of firewall logs you collect will tell you about money laundering and identity fraud. It might be useful later on in some kind of investigation, but it's not going to indicate those things. Yeah? If that's what the SOC needs to do for this organization. It needs very different tools to find those things. It needs to collect appropriate data to find those things. It needs people who are trained in those um, areas and trained to use those tools and processes to follow. Yeah. 
poor or inappropriate investment. I kind of talked about this earlier. Yeah, you could have the best, invested in the best tools in the world, but if they're not optimized, they're not getting the right content, the people don't know how to use them, the stock's going to fail. Insufficient skilled resources. So anybody who runs a SOC here, this is probably their number one thing. Yeah? It's not about just about finding resources, it's actually keeping them as well. Yeah, the retention rate in a SOC. Poor fidelity. So SOCs live and die on fidelity or accuracy. If, if a SOC thinks it's found some kind of security incident and it declares that as a security incident, and, and resource go into play and, and, and it costs money, and it's not really an incident, that doesn't look good. Yeah. What's probably worse is the opposite. So it hasn't found an incident and bad things happen. Yeah. So socks, socks difficult, it's very difficult. Poorly managed expectations. So often we find socks, no one has ever actually documented what the socks there to do. Yeah, so. One example here could be, you know, is a SOC eight by five business hours or is it 24 by seven? Yeah. Basic things like that are often not discovered until you get the, the 6.30 on a Friday night incident. Stock's eight by five, everybody's gone home. It's not discovered till Monday morning. Yeah. There's a huge uproar about this. I thought our stock was 24 by seven. Well, no, it's not. It's not 24, it's never been 24 by seven. Yeah. But no one's actually documented what it will and will not do. And finally, broken delivery models. So going back to a 24 by seven SOC, you may think you've got a 24 by seven SOC because you've got you know, analysts sitting in your SOC 24 by seven, but if the tools they rely on aren't supported 24 by seven and they go down at half past six on a Friday night, you haven't really got a 24 by seven SOC. So these are more, and I expect, I don't know if we, if we are seeing anybody after this, but if I expect to anybody in this room who, who runs socks or manages socks or works in a sock, you could probably come up with a, you know, a list longer than this, keep going and keep going. But these are some of the, the, the major challenges we see. So we talked about services before. Um, Cisco's approach to sock is built around ITIL. Um, lots, I know people are familiar in, with ITIL in the room, but ITIL was around for a very long time. You're basically starting off with a, with a strategy, what, what, what your SOC is there, what, what it needs to do. Once you know what it's gonna do, you can move on to designing the thing, you implement the thing, and you operate it. And you start again with your strategy. So it seems to work very, very well for, for SOC. Um, when we work with customers, we go in and we find out, well, what, what does your business require from your SOC? What does it need to do? What value does it need to provide to the business? Once we know that, we can work out what services or functions the SOC needs to deliver in order to provide that value. And once we know those services, we can work out the people process tools to deliver each of those services. So very much a top-down approach to this. So another question. I can't, I can't see very often the bright lights, but how many services would a, would a SOC typically deliver or provide? Any takers? There's a man about to speak there. More than 12. <laughs> I like that answer. <laughs> it depends. Yeah, it, de it depends what your business needs to the SOC to do. Yeah, so it might only need to provide four services or six services, that's what it needs to do. Or, or your SOC, I'm like the sound of your SOC, it's gonna do more than 12 <laughs> services, <laughs> okay? So, so let's have a look at a typical SOC portfolio, service portfolio for, for a SOC. Okay, so most SOCs, I would imagine, I can't think of one we've ever built or seen or been in or helped optimize or talk to SOC managers or CISOs about, does something like this. You know, most people say this is the core things a SOC would do. So you're gonna be having some kind of monitoring and response or, or, or detect and respond service, whatever you're gonna call it. You're gonna be collecting data, you're gonna be monitoring that data analyzing to see for signs of attack, triaging things. If you think you see a security incident, you're gonna pass it maybe to the next level, depending on how the, the SOC is, is organized, where someone's gonna investigate it, escalate, as we talked about earlier, either find more information or escalate to, to get things fixed. You're gonna, you're gonna remediate, sorry, you're gonna mitigate things, so you're gonna stop this thing happening, 
and you're going to remediate it afterwards. You're going to, when the dust is over, you're, you're going to tidy it up. You know, how, how far did it, did it, did it, did it um, get any further into our systems? All those sort of things, we're going to tidy up. A good SOC will do some kind of post-incident analysis. Yeah. So when the dust is settled and the incident's over, you're going to look back on that incident to see what happened. What's the narrative? What was the timeline? What did we do well? How long did we take to find these things? Could we have sped those things up? What in other information could we have used in order to investigate it quicker or react quicker? All those sort of things. So your SOC, you want to constantly be doing this to keep improving, and more of, more of that later. What lots of SOCs miss is a big focus on the management of the SOC. So a SOC isn't generally like another IT department. Yeah, the unusual places. Yeah. Big focus on strategy, where this thing's heading. Yeah. So the security landscape's always changing. Yeah, you need to keep, keep ahead of that or keep up with that. Um, big focus on operations, operations management. Yeah. Anybody who works in the stock will know all the metrics you collect and the KPIs and the KRIs you deduce from those and the SLAs and things you're monitoring, all those things you're monitoring. Um, team management. Lots of focus needs to be given to it in a SOC to team management. Yeah, SOCs are unusual places to work. You could have long periods of inactivity, so it's boring, and then all goes crazy. Yeah, huge periods of stress. Or, you, or your SOC could just be constant stress. Yeah, yeah, and people leave. So you need to think of ways of getting getting over that, either countering the boredom, giving people things to do, or stopping that stress. You know, maybe rotate people out. You do three weeks of this stressful job, and then you do a week of threat hunting. Because that's easy and relaxed, isn't it, Martin? <laughs> He's nodding. <laughs> um, IT management. Lots of, lots of socks. You go in, they say, oh, our, our sim's rubbish, because you put in a query, and it takes an hour to come back. You can't, can't use it, yeah? So that's usually due to the underlying IT that supports that. Yeah? It isn't up to scratch. Or over time, it's, it's, it's fallen behind. Um, vendor management, service provider management. All those sort of things, a lot of, lot of things you have to look after in a SOC. The other one is platform management, content management. So we kind of touched on this earlier. Who's going to look after those weird and wonderful and crazy platforms you get in a SOC? Yeah. It's not usually your IT department, because they're one-offs. So it's usually left to the SOC to do it. Yeah. And if the IT department did look after them, they probably wouldn't do a good job. Yeah. So all those platforms you have in a SOC, you want to make sure they're absolutely optimized, all the software levels are up to date, they've got the correct content on them, they are integrated with the other platforms in the SOC, um, I like to automate things. One of my colleagues, the best run SOC he ever visited, 70% of the people in that stock, 70% were doing this platform management piece. Yeah, again, sure, absolutely every single tool there was optimally, working optimally. Um, SOCs often as well, they leave, so that green block in the middle, that's usually run by analysts, obviously, security analysts, who tend to be very left field thinkers and you know, good investigators and things like that. Quite often a SOC leaves another one of their roles is to look after the platforms as well. Yeah. Your SOC platforms, you really want engineers looking after them. Yeah. Very, different, very different person to, a, to an analyst. Yeah. You want very steady, things are built properly, built consistently. That's another problem we see. So that's the first three elements. And then the fourth one I would hope to see in a SOC is some kind of threat intelligence function. And we've heard some of that this morning. So, um, so those are the four things I would, I would expect to see in a SOC. Um, but SOCs often do more. So the first one to talk about, and again, I won't get into Martin, still Martin's under, is, is threat hunting. So the green box there tends to be very much often in real time. Yeah, so you're collecting data, there's a stream of data coming into the SOC. You're, you've got systems and processes and, 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 and things analyzing that data as it comes in and flags up that it's seen something. And then you start investigating things like that. That's all very well if you hear about your threat intelligence function tells you about a new piece of malware you need to look out for. You put it in your system in the green box, and now you're looking for that. But what if your threat intelligence team or function tells you that there's a piece of malware that's been out for six months? that no one knew about? Has it got into your network and systems? How would you know? Yeah? You kind of almost need to look back in time. 
know, you need to be looking at the logs of your, you know, your whatever, endpoints, your um, perimeter systems and things like that, looking to see if it's come in. You need to have those logs somewhere. So you need to have stored them somewhere. As you're starting to get into the big data world, analytics on top of that to get to threat hunting. So I'm security testing. Who commissions the pen tests in an organization? Is it the IT department, the engineering department, the network department, or is it the SOC? Could be the SOC. Awareness, security training, awareness campaigns. Who, who commissions those? Fishing, cam you know, those fishing, I don't know if your organizers have, you know, fishing awareness campaigns. Who initiates those and runs those? Is it HR, is it finance? Could be the SOC. Vulnerability management. Probably about 50% of the SOCs that we see do vulnerability management. Yeah, the scanning of systems to see if they, they're patched properly or the operating systems are out of date. Yeah. It's usually the SOCs taking it on because they, the SOC gets so much grief from unpatched systems that it's so, right, we're going, to look, we're going to take this over. Again, the SOC isn't going to be going out and patching these systems, but it's kind of like policing them, doing the scanning, finding out what's vulnerable, reporting into the appropriate department that this system's, this system's vulnerable, and, and monitoring that they, or following through that they actually, actually fix them. And the list goes on. Alliance management, cybersecurity controls management, digital forensics. All these things and more we see in SOC. We were working with SOC last year, um, an organization they'd grown to become a global organization by acquisition. And their SOC was going to have a mergers and acquisitions service in it. So whenever they decided they were going to buy a new um, organization and add it to the, the parent organization, the SOC's job was to go in, assess how secure their networks and systems were, and get them up to a certain level before they were allowed to join the parent company. Yeah. SOCs end up doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So these services, how do we describe them or how do we document them? So first, we obviously describe the service itself. The benefits of the service. You know, if you can't articulate the benefits of this service, why would you, why would you do it? Why would you spend money and effort, effort doing it? Who owns it? Operational model. What components make up the service? So you saw that green box in the middle of that last slide where we broke down that monitoring and response service into components. We can do that with all the services or even break them down into subcomponents. Standard architectural type stuff, what, what inputs are needed for those components to, to do their job, where do we get those inputs from, what outputs is it given, and, and to where, who's going to consume it, and the service level parameters. You know, SOCs are often about measuring these things, what metrics can we collect about it, what KPIs can we deduce from it, what KRIs can we get to indicate things going bad. So we define our services. Here's service one, we've defined service one. Once we know what service one looks like, we can define the people, the process tools we need to, to deliver that. So add another service, service two, people process tools. Now we've got two services. We can work out how they're going to talk together, how they're going to work together um, from a process point of view and, and, and the technology as well. So we talked a bit earlier about you know, which is most important, people process technology. It kind of depends on the service. So something like threat hunting, Martin's going to speak to you about, if Martin was overloaded with process, he'd never find anything. You know, it would make it, make it too narrow for him to do anything. So Martin, in threat hunting, it's probably more about people. You know, people are going to think around these problems and, and, and help find these things with, with some technology. You probably need some kind of overarching framework to work to. Something like vulnerability management, where you want to make sure you consistently scan the whole of your network and systems, it's more about process and technology. Than, than the people element. But where the two interact, so where threat hunting and vulnerability management, which they could interact, we definitely need process there. So if Martin finds through threat hunting some thing we now need to scan and look for, he needs to tell the vulnerability management people or service in a consistent way that we don't miss anything about this new thing to, to start threat hunting for. Sorry, to start scanning for, maybe. What's the other thing? Once we've defined these services, we can start to build operational models. We briefly talked about those earlier. So here's an operational model where we've decided we're going to deliver everything internally or predominantly internally. Yeah? It's going to be an internal SOC. We've only ever built 
two socks which had been wholly internal. Uh, they were both government socks who wanted to keep everything internal. And I've heard one of those has now outsourced one of its services to, to an outside company. Um, so very high level list of services there. Um, what have they outsourced? Well, what if the sock gets into trouble? Yeah, so they're kind of going along, everything's fine, but what if there's some huge incident that they don't have the, you know, the people to deal with or some complex incident that they can't deal with? Um, they might buy in some kind of emergency instant retainer service. Yeah? Someone to call, someone to get some help if there's problems they can't deal with. Or forensics and malware. So what if there's an incident, some kind of insider problem, courts of law are going to be involved, you're going to investigate that in a certain way that you can collect evidence that's submittable to a court of law, then again, you may not have someone sitting in your sock who knows the law inside out for every country that you're operating, um, and you're not going to have them sitting there just waiting for this incident to happen, which may not happen or happens a couple of times a year. So again, you might outsource that, appoint some kind of forensics company that can come in and help you should you need it. The opposite of that is outsource everything. So you often speak to, to, to organizations and say, well, we don't want anything to do with SOC. We know we need to have a SOC, but it's not our core business to run. You know, we sell tires or we do <laughs> manufacture something or whatever. We don't, we don't want to run SOC. We're going to outsource it all. People think they're going to outsource it all, but you still need some kind of SOC-like functions. So well, they've outsourced all these things. You're paying these people to do them for you. And they'll have service level agreements, SLAs. They're going to do this to a certain, a certain um, performance rate. Um, you need to monitor those. You need to look after those providers, make sure they're doing a good job. You need to monitor how well they're doing, all those sort of things. So you need some kind of service management, sort of management type function there. And also, lots of these organizations, they, they'll often monitor your data for you and watch it 24 by 7. They'll investigate things and find things. When they find a security incident, they're not going to get, back to my earlier point, they're not getting in a van and drive and clear it up for you, clear up a PC for you. They're not going to put a rule on your firewall to block something. They're going to throw it back over the fence to you. Yeah? So you probably need some kind, of, some kind of team there to actually look after the coordination of getting those things fixed, sorted out. So returning to those challenges, which ones does this solve? this kind of top-down services-based approach. Well, it definitely solves the first one, that bottom-up versus top-down approach. Um, poor and appropriate investment, you would hope from designing from the top, starting with what you need, not how you're going to do it, you would, you would get that, that sorted. Does it solve the resource problem? Maybe. You know, maybe if you, if you really start from the top, you'll build your sock in a place where there are already other socks and there are a, a community of people who can come and work in a SOC, or you build your SOC next to a university, whether you know there's a, a lot of cybersecurity engineer graduates coming out, things like that. Poor fidelity, hopefully it will help a bit. Um, poorly managed expectations definitely helps with. Yeah, I'm going to very, very clearly outline in the strategy for the SOC what it will and won't do, and get that agreed in terms of, of budgets. Um, and the broken delivery models. Hopefully, by this top-down approach, we actually capture everything we need to do to keep this thing going. Right, automation. This is the hot topic in, in SOC at the moment, I said earlier. Um, how do I automate my SOC? Um, often to do with, I can't find enough people I need to automate. Um, but there are other, other advantages as well. Um, the way the market's gone over the years, we've seen, um, a few years ago, we have security case management systems. SOCs often like to have their own ticketing system. They don't like to use the, the ITSM ticket system of the organization because they might be investigating people who have access to those, that ticketing system. Yes, yeah, so they like to have their own case management system. They gradually rolled to be orchestration and case management systems where you would put in some kind of workflow in them as well, prescribe workflow. And the, the latest buzzword, or a year or two old now, is SOAR. SOAR is security, orchestration, automation, and response. And sometimes you see a, a double R at the end for, for reporting. So what we're going to do now is we're going to orchestrate end-to-end -end workflows. So your SOC, if it knows how to deal with certain use cases, it may have playbooks. So let's take malware. 
how do you deal with malware? How do we spot malware? How do we investigate malware? What are the steps we go through to do that? If you have that, you can put it into one of these tools and have those steps in there. How do we automate some of the tasks? So some of those tasks in that workflow, that orchestration, you might be able to go and automate. So a particular use case, you know, steps one, two, and three are always go and pull the logs off these machines. Yeah. So why not automate that? Why have a security analyst tapping in the commands to do that, getting back those, that data and put it into case? Why not, why not do it automatically? And the controversial one is the response. Yeah. So James, James touched on this earlier. And I, I saw when he said the, um, whichever attack it was, within minutes they were, had overtaken so many machines or whatever. Yeah. Can you afford not to have automatic response? Yeah, just the speed these things happen. The downside of that is obviously, and the pushback is, is false positives. And you could, all these things could be going into action and responding and, and I don't know, whatever it's going to do, <laughs> knocking people off systems and stuff, and it could be a false positive. So that's, that's the scary bit of that one. And reporting. So these, these tools often have, you know, we've already said about, you know, SOCs love their metrics. Yeah. So it records those automatically and will produce useful reports that a SOC, SOC would want to see. What's quite interesting in the market and, and seeing it develop is, is, is do the big players, do you, do you go native or specialist platform? So specialist platform is you know, um, a tool which is a saw, which is a standalone platform. We've also seen the, the big players in, in, in the you know, SIM and stuff like that also bolting on um, saw workflow automations to their products. Um, and now we've seen what's happening is the, those big players are actually buying the specialist platforms up, bolting them on. So we saw recently uh, Fortinet bought uh, Cybersponse, Splunk bought Phantom, and there's a, there's a load more examples like that. So now they're kind of merging those two things together. Gartner-wise, what are they saying? So from today here, but that's 2019, so last year, so, so a I would judge that. They say a, a SOC with more than five people in it. At the moment, 5% of them are using SOAR, but by the end of 2022, so three years' time, 30% will. So that's, what Gartner, that's where Gartner are saying it's, it's going to. So let's see SOAR in action. Okay? So let's, let's give, you, give you an example. So um, here's your SOC in red. Um, what we've done here is we've we put some of the services the SOC is, is doing. That's the usual suspects, monitoring this response, analytics, threat intelligence on there. We often use these maps to, we can, we can map people to them, we can map processes to them, but here we're gonna map platforms, technology to them. We've got telemetry and data sources coming in and control platforms. We've got external sources of information, so threat intelligence and things like that. And we've also got other platforms that are inside the organization that the SOC also could use. Yeah, so think, you know, Active Directory and CMDB and things like that. So what we used to say was the heart of SOC would be the security analytics system. Yeah, so some kind of SIM or SIEM or, well, we can't even decide how to pronounce um, SIEM or SIEM. <laughs> so, <laughs> once, we, once we decide what we're gonna call our SOC. Um, probably some kind of dashboard or reporting system connected to that. Um, this, this here is it, it's separate, but could, could be combined with the, the analytics platform. Um, this particular SOC um, has got some kind of big data platform, yeah, which also talks to the, the, the dashboards, the reporting. And all the telemetry and the data and the things we're collecting from the network and systems are all feeding into that, that, that big data platform. It's just one example of architecture of a SOC. What else have we got here? Threat intelligence. We're getting threat intelligence from external providers. That's going to a threat intelligence platform, which is feeding into that, that analytics platform. Vulnerability management system. That's feeding its data into that big data platform as well. That's come, starting to become like a repository for everything. So if this was your SOC as it is now, with analysts running it, we're well, always going to have analysts running it, but you know, telemetry would feed into that analytics platform sorry, it's put into the logging system, the analytics platform will be looking at that. It would, it would do its magic and think it's found something. This looks like it could be malware, or this looks like it could be this. 
So that's going to flag up something to an analyst. If they're watching the screen at the time and they see it, they're going to start investigating it. They may well have a playbook for that particular type of attack, that use case that they run through, or they may have done it lots of times before and they don't regard, they don't look at that playbook, or there might be no playbooks, or different analysts deal with things in different ways. What happens when we get SOAR in place is everything happens as before, but the security analytics platform, instead of waiting for an analyst to, to notice this thing has flashed up, it's going to talk to the SOAR and it's going to automatically raise a security case based on whatever use case it is. And it's go, ah, it's malware. I have a playbook for malware. That's the orchestration piece. I'm going to start running through these steps. So first thing it's going to do in this case, it's going to go and talk to the CMDB. Yeah? I'm sure everybody here has a very accurate, up-to-date CMDB asset register. Always are. <laughs> Lots of nodding and wry smiles there. Yeah? Well, let's go and find out at least who we think <laughs> owns this machine and where it lives. Yeah? And we'll put it in the case. Yeah? We'll just do that automatically. Why not? What else are we going to do? We've got this massive log of data. Yeah? Let's go and find out everything. You know, we know this IP address we think is infected. Let's go and find out what else has been happening to it from all the stuff we've collected. Put it in the case. We know what the malware is, or we think we do. Let's go talk to the threat intelligence platform. Find out some more about it. Put it in the case. Might be the recommended ways of dealing with it, that sort of thing. When was it last scanned? It was last scanned two weeks ago because our organization takes a month to go around every single system before it cycles back again. It was done two weeks ago. Let's kick off another vulnerability scan. Let's get it scanned. Let's see what it, what it is now. Put it in the case. Let's talk to all sorts of other systems, DNS, um, identity and access management, ISBIT, if that's, that's what you're using, um, Active Directory. Let's, let's email someone, <laughs> ask them to find something for us, look up something. Everything the analyst would normally do and take a long time to do, yeah, you're going to do automatically. And then you're going to present the analyst with all the information it will take a lot, you'll normally take them a long time to, to do. They can do their investigation now much quicker. They've got all the information they need. It doesn't stop them going and finding out more information. Um, and then they can decide to take appropriate action. What you could do, so why I put it in dashed, is you could automatically, the saw could actually automatically go and make whatever is needed. Yeah. And that's why I put it in dash, because it's controversial. But with the speed these things are happening, can you afford not to? Um, we were working with a SOC in Turkey, and they had such a strong use case, which was such a high fidelity, and was so important to them, they decided to implement SOAR because of that, that one use case. Yeah. This thing was, happened a lot. They had a huge, huge um, uh, view that it was actually that happening when it did happen. They were faith in their tools, and they could put a monetary value against when it does happen, so they put this in to do it automatically, just for that one use case. Yeah. So what challenges does this solve? So the other ones, maybe. But insufficient skill resources, yeah. Various levels that helps you. So you can probably process more, you know, and, and these things are always increasing. Um, you free up the analyst time to do what they like doing. They don't like going and pulling logs from all these various things and stuff like that. All the information is prevented to them. Keep them happier. And hopefully, at least for these, these you know, standard things the SOC has to deal with, day after day, business as usual type things that you know how to deal with, you can, you can have that in a defined, orchestrated way which you deal with it the same every time. Yeah. There may be other things the SOC has to deal with which you've never seen before or are weird, those sort of things. That's when the analysts really need to get involved. But those business as usual things that happen all the time, malware, getting on things, yeah, you can deal with. So SOC roadmap. How am I doing for time, Martin? Are you about to kick me? Five minutes, okay, about to be kicked off. But, um, how do you build a SOC? Yeah, well, building a SOC is easy. You plan and design it. <laughs> you build it, and you operate it, and you improve it, and you keep on improving it. Yeah, 
Why is it vital for a SOC to keep on improving? I kind of talked about this before. Well, the number of threats out there is increasing. The complexity of the threats is increasing. Your attack surface or your organization is increasing all the time. If you're SOC, you train everybody up, you get some systems in, and you train people up on them, and you never improve, your SOC will get worse. Over time, it will gradually get worse and worse and worse. You need to keep improving. You need to keep training your people. You need to keep um, updating those systems. You need to integrate them. You need to collect more data, all these things to stay ahead of the curve. Yeah. And that's partly why, or one of the main reasons why SOX collects so many metrics and drive all those KPIs and KRIs, because they want to make sure they're not falling below, yeah? not falling behind. How long does it take to plan and design a SOC? Any takers? It kind of, it kind of depends. <laughs> but again, there's no, there's, no, there's no set number. But six months will be very difficult. Twelve months is hard. Two years is, is good. Depending on what your sock's doing. Depending on what your sock's doing. So, probably got two minutes to each of these slides. One or two minutes. So, I've shown a time scale down here. 52, 52 weeks? Yeah, 52 weeks a year. Yeah because it's easier to talk about. So what do we do first? We have that planning designing phase. So first we work out what the strategy is. What is the SOC there to do? Why are we building it? What's it there to do? Let's work out what it needs to do then, what services it's going to provide. Once we know that, we can look around the organization. What's already there? What can we reuse? We know where we want to be now with our strategy. What's already there we can reuse? We might do some kind of capability assessment. Then we can start designing these services. Yeah. So, you know, what do they look like? All the metrics we're going to collect from them. How are we going to govern the thing? How are we going to, what's the organizational structure look like? Yeah, given our resource constraints and our HR departments, policies and things like that, what does that tree structure in the SOC, you know, SOC manager, whatever their title will be, managers below them, whatever, SOC analysts, what are the job roles? Um, what are the um, uh, um, Trading plans, all those sort of things. We can design those. Processes, we know about processes. What does that architecture look like, technically? Yeah? Kind of a bit like the diagram I, I showed you before. What are the tools and how do they integrate? How, how do they need to integrate to deliver those services efficiently? Business case for how we're, how we're actually going to do the SOC, RFP. Yeah? You're going to be buying platforms into RFP for those. You're probably going to be buying services in your SOC to RFP for those. And finally, we need to plan, and produce a huge program plan to build it. Yeah, so this is what usually takes the time. So internally, internal delivery transition, we need to build the room the SOC's going to sit in. Classic SOC would be a bit like here with a big video wall, rows of desks, if that's your, the way you're going to do it. Um, we need to recruit people. We need to train people. Yeah, external delivery transition, we need to... We need to appoint service providers, bring them on board, um, develop the processes, how's the whole thing's going to work, you know, who's going to be responsible for what, who do they hand over which bits to, when, etc. Use cases and playbooks. Um, we touched on those briefly. Um, deploying the technology stack, and about halfway through, all this stuff has got to work together. So we're just already starting to test how well these things are working, how well they're working together, improving them, before after nine months on this plan, we go SOC established. We don't go SOC live, we go SOC established. Everything's in place, and we're gonna spend three months now making sure it's all working really, really well um, before we go SOC live. What do we do in year two? And I'm about to be kicked off. So year two, and forevermore, we need to check this, how well the SOC doing. So we do all things like benchmarking, purple team testing, red team testing. After a year, we revisit, revisit our strategy. Services, we're adding more services. We're starting to threat hunt, which nicely lines up for Martin. Um, and the people process tools. Yeah, so we're improving the processes, the people, training them. Processes we're improving, hosting some analysis processes, use cases, playbooks. Um, and finally, we're augmenting that technology. We're, we're um, collecting additional data sources and we're um, going into that orchestration and automation, a saw bit we talked about earlier. So that's it. I think I'm about to be pushed off the stage now. <laughs> right, thank you, you so much. Um, 
I, I, I love Simon's talk. I really, really enjoy it. I enjoy listening to um, his approach of very well designed, very well thought through, very well planned socks and how successful they are. And then I look what we've done, um, which is kind of different. There's some overlap, but there's clearly a lot of things that we have done differently in the Talos threat hunting team. And it's very interesting to compare how we've gone about what we do and where we've been successful and where we've been able to conjure up a little bit of magic, which I think is this extra ingredient that helps bring success, or at least it has in our case. Very briefly, um, who am I? I lead the Talos outreach team within Europe for Talos. Um, I've been in security now, actually next week it will be 17 years, about 25 years in IT, uh, seven years within uh, threat intelligence. Um, but originally, I'm a, a human viral geneticist. I started out my career researching the genetics of human viruses and almost by accident find myself in the world of computer viruses, which is quite interesting. And like Simon, I'm a very keen runner. Unlike Simon, I'm not particularly good at it, but I, I still enjoy it. Talos is Cisco's threat intelligence and security research organization. What we do is make sense of the threat landscape which is out there, collect and mine all of the telemetry and the information that we have coming to us as part of Cisco, make sense of that and turn it into actionable intelligence, those rules, those signatures, those updates that are pushed out into the product portfolio which help protect our customers and all Cisco security customers from threats. Uh, as of this month, we also have another arm, which is that of services. So incident response services within EMEA are also now delivered as part of Talos. We have been very, very successful in what it is that we do in terms of threat hunting. We've been able to identify a VPN filter. This was a, a very, very large network, half a million devices that had been compromised, predominantly small office and home office devices that were being prepared for a large attack. We don't know what that large attack is because we were able to detect it, work with our partners in the public sector and get that attack stopped and get the malicious command and control infrastructure dismantled before the attack could happen. We've identified many remote access Trojans and been the first to identify them and characterize them. We've been able to identify and characterize novel forms of ransomware which are out there. Um, other rats, cannibal rats, we've been able to identify a previously unknown um, threat actor group targeting the Korean Peninsula. And then, perhaps most significantly, sea, sea turtle, which I think is, is actually the most significant threat that we're faced on the internet at the moment. This is a new threat actor who is undermining the DNS system, one of the fundamental protocols that allows the internet to happen, and also undermining the, um, uh, the identification of entities and the validity, the verification of entities, entities using the TLS system. We've also been recognized um, as an award-winning team. SE Media has uh, awarded us the most important cybersecurity discoveries by our company research team last year. We also, uh, a couple of months ago, were awarded the Peter Zor Award from Virus Bulletin, which for us, it, it, this is a massive thing. This is the, our peers within the threat intelligence security research community recognizing us as having made the most significant identifications and findings in threat intelligence over the last year. Simon describes uh, very, very nicely how you go about threat hunting. We need this mixture of tools, data, and procedures. And I think naively people tend to uh, um, think of threat hunting is I take some tools, 
I have a big bunch of data, I have some people, and I put them in a kind of sausage mixture, sausage maker, and I turn the handle, and out of the bottom comes neatly identified threats. Doesn't really work like that. Um, it works in some cases, and certainly every SOC is different, and every activity that a SOC does is different. But in our own case, this isn't the way that we've approached this. For us, threat hunting is very much a stack. We need a stack of technology in order to find threats. And the relative importance of the different layers in this stack are actually very significant, and they're not the same. We certainly need data. We need some kind of hunting ground in which we're going to hunt threats. That data does not necessarily need to be internal. It doesn't necessarily need to come from your own environment and for you to collect it yourselves. There's an awful lot of data that we can mine in external systems that are available commercially. Of course, we'll find more if we do have internal, but it, we need a mix of the two. Clearly, we need tools. We need something which is going to enable us to ask questions of this data and solve puzzles and give us answers to things that we'd like to know. But for me, this is actually quite a narrow band within our threat hunting stack. The most important thing for me is the people. This is what we need. It is people who do threat hunting. It's not the tool. The tool will help you find things, but you're going to find nothing unless you have the right people who are there looking for it and understanding what it is that they're finding. But you can very, very easily stifle even the best threat hunting team with a bad culture. It's all about having good people with the right attitude and the right knowledge and skills working together in the right culture, which enables them to go out and hunt threats. And this little tiny bit on top, a strategy. It's important. We need to have it there. We need to know what it is that we're doing. But it's actually only a very, very thin part of the threat hunting stack. In terms of strategy, I, I think it boils down to something very, very simple. Um, you need to know what is it that you're hoping to find. Because if you don't know what you're looking for, you will never find it. You need to have some idea of what it is that you're hoping to find. And then I think what's often forgotten, certainly within threat intelligence, what are you going to do when you find it? What are you hoping to achieve? And it's very, very important for uh, your budget holders to be able to demonstrate that you're actually achieving something, that you are protecting the organization, that you are moving secu that security posture forwards and improving things. So we need to have a way that we're measuring this and also focus. We know what it is that we're looking for. We know what we're going to do when we find this. And we know how we're going to contribute to the security of our organization or the goals and the metrics of our SOC. In terms of our own team, threat hunting within Talos, it's very clear. We are looking for significant new threats. We are looking for the newest, most significant changes in the threat environment, those new techniques that the bad guys are coming up with, because we want to protect our customers by creating this threat intelligence, by creating the rules, signatures, and updates, getting that out into the product portfolio, but also informing the community, the security community as a whole, telling people this is what's happening. This is what's happening now. These are the new things that the bad guys are coming up with. Intelligence is very much a, a, a military word. We tend to think of it in the context of military intelligence. The military has many years of experience in creating and using intelligence. And since the Second World War, they've come up with this model, the intelligence cycle, um, which is very useful. It's very useful for us to adopt and look about how this is relevant and also how it's not relevant to the world of cyber. Certainly, we start at the top with some concept of planning and direction. 
We have a question that we wish to answer, and we have some idea of how we're going to go about answering that question. First thing that we want to do is actually go out and collect some data. Look in our data to see if it contains that answer. In the cyber world, very, very quickly, you will find almost certainly you don't have the data that can actually answer the questions that you'd really like to know. It's two things that we can do here. Um, I think in the grown-up world of Simon, probably the correct thing to do is go to your executives and say, yeah, we don't have this data that we really like to, uh, to have in order to answer the questions that we really want to ask. Please, can we have some investment in order to collect this? Uh, and that's lovely, and maybe in a year's time, you might have that data available in a form which you can use. Often, we actually reverse our cycle a little bit, and we can say, well, we don't quite have the data that we need in order to answer this question, but the data that we have supports this kind of similar question, which is kind of answering the same thing. Is that good enough? Often, we can use this cycle of going around and saying, well, we can't answer this question, but we can answer this one. Is, is that enough? And frequently, for a few cycles of iteration around that, we can actually come up with some very, very pertinent and important questions that we can answer given the data that we have. We have to work in the real world with what is available to us. Once we've queried our data and we've got back uh, you know, enormous amounts of information, we then need to process that and turn it into something which is human readable, which we can make sense of all of that raw data, and then add context around that so our end users who are supplying this intelligence to actually know what to do with it. Um, that dissemination piece is very, very important. If we find something, we need to be able to respond to that and get that intelligence in the hands of somebody that can actually do something with it and improve our security posture. I think there's two models that we can adapt in order to do that. The first is very, very much that of the service catalog, in that we create and define processes, repeatable, predictable processes. Managers love pre repeatable, predictable processes. They're very easy to, to manage. They're very easy to measure. We can identify our best people, because they're the ones that go through the most of these repeatable, you know, predictable processes the most frequently in the shortest amount of time. Um, they have very nice defined inputs and outputs. They have their place, um, but I think their problem is, is very well illustrated by this kind of question. The type of thing that you might be very, very interested in in threat intelligence is when a new threat intelligence report comes out, you want to know, are we affected? Have we been hit by this threat? Your threat intelligence report has some nice indicators of compromise, some uh, domain names, some IP addresses, some SHA values of the malware. Your boss wants to know, have we been affected? Well, great. We can go through our process. We can have our planning and direction. Great, we want to look through our logs to see if we find this SHA value, if we've connected to this particular malicious domain, search through our data, analyze it, come to the conclusion, yes or no. We have a very clear yes if we've been hit, or a very clear no, we have not been hit. We have not seen these indicators of compromise in our system. But if our bad guy had changed a single byte within the malware, you'd have a completely different SHA value. If that threat actor had used a slightly different network or infrastructure for their command and control and had a slightly different domain name or a slightly different IP address, we'd come out with a no. We would have actually have answered that question, have we seen these IOCs in our data? but this wouldn't tell us if we'd been hit or not 
by that particular attack or that particular campaign. I think what we need to do is look at this in a different way and ask slightly different questions. What we really should be asking ourselves is, okay, given this threat intelligence report, have we seen something similar in our environment? Not exactly the same thing, but something that kind of looked like that. And to set off this process of reflection, what might something like that, not exactly the same thing, but something similar, look like in our environment? Now that kicks off a process of reflection, of investigation, and it's something which is very much undeterminable. We can't parameterize this into a nice tight procedure that we can have as a playbook, that we can start at the beginning and follow our ways down. We need to have something which is quite innovative. We need our analysts to continuously ask that question, well, what if, what if this happened? What might it look like? What traces might it leave in our data? What else might be happening? And go through that process again and again and again and thinking what might happen when we find a way of looking at our data that works and brings us something new. Okay, great, then here we have a process that we can actually turn into some kind of procedure. In fact, we don't really want to waste our people's brain power on working through procedures. We want a machine to do that. This is where SOAR comes uh, uh, into play. Yeah, if it's something which can be parameterized, turned into procedure, let's get a machine doing that, and we'll keep our people doing what people do best, which is using their imagination, their intelligence, their sense of innovation, to continuously ask those questions, what might be happening? What might it look like? What I will say to you is don't create an assembly line. This 19th and 20th century way of working where we have people with very tightly defined work and responsibilities doing repetitive tasks again and again and again, very easy to measure, very easy to reward, don't do it. This is the 19th century way of working. We're in a 21st century world. The threat landscape is continuously changing. We need a different way of working. We need a different way of looking for this. We don't quite know how we're going to find the latest threats, but the way that we're going to find them is through innovation, doing new things, trying new things. We have to recognize we don't necessarily have all the answers ourselves or all the knowledge. We're going to have to work together with many different people and with many different groups and collaborate on these techniques and share information. But we want to be focused on a goal. We want to have a very, very clear idea of what it is that we are trying to achieve. We want to find those newest threats. We want to find the bad guys in our network. We want to provide the best protection. We need to have a very clear goal, a very clear idea of where we're trying to get to. And in anything innovative, we're going to get it wrong far, far more often than we're going to get it right. There's going to be many, many failures in trying new ways of looking at data and new ways of hunting the bad guys. Um, what we need to do is fail early, get it wrong very, very quickly, fail fast, never mind, try something else and support our people who are mostly going to get it wrong. That's what we want to recognize. This is what we want to encourage. Have lots of ideas, try them fast, get it wrong. Never mind. One in a hundred ideas, you will get it spot on and you will find things that no one else has ever found before. But in order to get that, you need to get it wrong time and time and time again. I love Simon's comment about the sock about having the location for a sock and something like a room like this. Um, I spent ages looking for a suitable stock photo that would demonstrate how we work in our threat hunting team. This was the best one that I could find. Um, a bloke on his sofa with his dogs. This is how we work. We're an entirely remote team. Uh, we all work from home. Um, yeah, most of us are working on a sofa with our dogs. Uh, it's a very, very different model from what you might imagine a sock to look like. But where it works is that we have a very, very strong sense of mission, 
of what it is that we're trying to achieve. And that sense of mission creates this very high degree of motivation, of self-motivation, which becomes reinforcing within the team. There's a lot of peer encouragement throughout the team and also peer collaboration, which helps what we do to become, and I've heard it described as this, it's not a job, it's a lifestyle. So that concept of the sock working from uh, you know, 8.30 till five, when it becomes a lifestyle, it's not like that at all. And in those moments where there isn't much going on, well, great, you know, go, go take the kids to school, the dog to the vet, you know, whatever you need to do in your life. Because when it kicks off, and it will do, when we find something really interesting, at that point, there's a very high degree of motivation. Yeah, we want to solve this. We want to find this. We want to find out what's happening. And if everyone's working from home, we don't have that problem that often we have in the SOC. Um, how do I feed people? It's now 7 p.m. We've got all hands to the pump. Uh, we need to think about getting people home because there's no more trains. They've missed the last bus. We need to arrange taxis. We need to get food in. People working from home, you don't need to worry about that. And people will happily work on the threat because it's part of what they do. It is their lifestyle. It is part of them rather than just a job. Great example of this is sea turtle. How we discovered sea turtle, how we discovered what was going on. Um, it actually starts uh, from an insult. Um, somebody on Twitter sent us this particular malware that they'd looked at, which has got a base64 encoded string in there, source fire sucks. Many of our team have come from the source fire acquisition into Talos, and here we have a threat actor actively taunting us in their malware. We can't stand for this. We can't have this happen. So here we have a, a red rag to a bull. We want to find out what's happening. We want to hunt down this threat actor, and we definitely want to make sure that his malware is detected the instant that he is releasing this. So we analyze the malware, and we find that it's, condu it's um, conducting command and control traffic over DNS, which is kind of interesting. It's unusual. We set up rules to find further examples of malware that conducts command and control using DNS, and uh, Dia talked about it earlier. And this threw up this particular document, which drops a malicious file which conducts command and control over DNS. We found the IP addresses that it was connecting to, which is interesting in itself. And then there's that moment, what else? What else might be happening? What other things might be associated with that? And we start looking at these IP addresses in more detail, and we actually found that one of those IP addresses the webmail of a governmental organization pointed for a relatively short amount of time at this IP address. That is a big O moment. Clearly, there is something very, very wrong happening here. Um, government, governmental domains should not point at malicious IP addresses for a short amount of time. Clearly, something wrong is here, and we want to find out more. So we identified that we've got a range of, um, of domains who have also had their, I, their domains pointed at malicious IP addresses. We can also identify at the same time that we've got this redirection, also somebody issued a Let's Encrypt certificate for this particular domain. Um, so the threat actor is in control or has a TLS certificate, an X509 certificate for this particular domain because they have convinced a, uh, an issuer of domain validated certificates that they control the domain. It's not false. Um, but if you think through the implications of that, it's fairly scary. So, what we do, we want to tell the community about this because it's very, very important that they understand what's happening. We publish this as soon as we're able, and we like to think that people are reading our blogs and, uh, and taking action from this. And in fact, this is what's happened. Um, we created a lot of news in the press, and there was a lot of discussion about what this means for the DNS system and also for um, uh, TLS. Uh, certificates and verification of identities. 
and we get, we result in the Department of Homeland Security very significantly and very rarely issuing this emergency directive telling all the entities in the public sector in the US to validate and audit their DNS information. Now for us this is kind of interesting because this tells us that actually there's probably more to this story, there's more going on. And because we were talking about it and we were sharing the information that we had, we had further information coming into us, further intelligence of people basically phoning us up and saying, hmm, yeah, you should look at this. And taking that information, that intelligence which was coming to us, combining that with our analysis of the data to which we had access, we were able to piece together this full picture of what was actually going on and what was actually happening. If we reflect on the steps that allowed us to identify this full picture, there's actually very, very few tools indeed, but there is an awful lot of engagement. Our first step was actually someone hanging out on Twitter. You know, how many socks, how many people encourage their analysts and their workers, you know, just hang out on Twitter and tweet your friends. You know, this was how we started. This was, what we, this was our first finding. So we've got this community engagement of someone sharing with us uh, observation that they'd found in their own investigations that they thought would be of interest to us. That would turn into an automated rule to go out and look for more things. So we've got our interesting observation where we've got that command control over DNS, turn that into an, an automated process. Again, that pulls out something which is interesting, that first piece of malware. We then have that perfect thing asking that question, what else? That moment of reflection, what else is happening? What else could be going on? That allows us to find the, uh, um, the DNS redirection. Again, we've got that community engagement, sharing it with the wider community, which allows us for further information to come in, which allows us to put together that full picture. So what would I recommend? What would I say to you? How do you, how should you go about hunting threats? Mostly, when I talk about this, the first things that people think are, well, we need a seam and we need the dark web. We're going to go hunting for things on the dark web and we're going to have a seam and this is going to be all the threat intelligence that we ever need. Starting with a seam isn't a bad place to start. Certainly, aggregating the various bits of data that you have in your organization and getting it together and have it searchable in one place is a very, very good place to start. Um, I would be cautious about over-reliance on a seam. Part of the problem with the seam is it will present information to you in a way that the software engineers who were developing the seam thought was useful. Five years ago, when they were developing the product, it may have well have been cutting edge. Five years later, chances are the threat landscape has moved on and has changed. And if you're reliant on those views and those panes of glass and that visibility that your seam is giving you, your chances are you're going to miss stuff. What you need to be is being able to ask questions of the data. People get very excited about the dark web and say, yeah, you know, there's all sorts of bad guys out there on the dark web discussing attacks. And we're going to find when they're discussing you, and that will give you a heads up. Uh, like, OK, yeah, no, that's really, really interesting. We can find interesting things on the dark web. Certainly, we can find samples of malware. Certainly, we can find things being discussed. However, if we think about the set of things that actually happen, and the set of things that are discussed on the dark web, um, one, we have this gap here of things that are discussed that don't actually happen. And we've got all this stuff which is actually happened that was never discussed on the dark web. You would not have found WannaCry being discussed on the dark web. You don't find NotPetya being discussed on the dark web before it happened. You don't find um, uh, Sea Turtle being discussed on the dark web. There's an awful lot of stuff which is happening out there which isn't discussed in advance on the dark web. What you really need to concentrate on are those things that you need to worry about. Not everything bad that happens is actually a problem. 
We need to identify those things which are important to you. There may be some overlap with the dark web, but most of that stuff you're going to be finding in your data, in your environment, and you're only going to find that through looking, looking for it. So if we're going to think about this stack, that bit of strategy at the top, think about what it is that you are hoping to find. What are you looking for? And once you've found that thing, what are you going to do with it? And that may well indeed involve thinking about your service catalog and thinking about interfacing with other teams. Question which is often overlooked, are there better things to do? You know, threat hunting is quite labor intensive. You require analysts looking for things. It may well be that those resources and those financial resources that you have might be better spent on vulnerability management, on better patching or backup. So I think even before you start threat hunting, think, are there other pieces of our security posture that actually we should get right first? Key thing, I think, is all about culture. Um, for God's sake, don't build an assembly line. Give that freedom of action, of innovation, of creation, of discovery to your analysts and let them and encourage them to have that freedom to go and hunt. It'll involve lots and lots of partnerships and connections throughout the entire security industry. So again, encourage that. Get your people communicating, communicating, get them working with others, and most importantly, enable your team to hunt in the knowledge that mostly they're going to be wrong. But that's okay. We're going to encourage that. We're going to accept it because when we do get it right, we will find stuff that no one else has ever found before. People are key, and we need a certain type of person. We certainly need some sort of technical skills and awareness of security and what it is that might be out there. We also need a mix of people who have the data skills, who can analyze the data, who can spot outliers, who can cluster activity together. It will be there in your data, but you need to know how to ask the questions and what questions you can ask of the data. But most of all, I would say hire curiosity. Hire people who have that nose for a scent, that they want to find out how something works, that they want to find out what's going on, because basically it's that, that's the bit that can't be taught. That's that character trait that we really find in all of our best threat hunters. Our tools are all about facilitating our people, our threat hunters, to ask questions of the data. We want tools that make that easy and that don't try and push you down a particular way of thinking or don't try and present you the data in one particular way. We want tools that allow us to ask many, many questions, and we want it to be really easy to ask them and quick to get a response. Because if we're asking a question today and we have to go away overnight and come back in the next day to get an answer, by then it's probably too late. We need fairly responsive tools that can analyze and loop through and search very, very large amounts of data. That data itself, think about what it is that you need that's probably driven from that strategy, that question, what it is that you're hoping to find. If you are really, really interested in uh, money laundering, no, the firewall logs will not help you with that. Um, think about what it is that you need. Think about what you can actually get access to. What is realistic? What's going to be achievable in a fairly short time frame, in a manageable time frame? It would be lovely to have access to everything. It's never going to happen. What data can we get fairly easily, fairly rapidly, that's actually going to help us answer those questions that we need. And then again, think about the storage. How long do we need this data? In fact, I'm really, really interesting, interested in everything that's happening today. I'm really interested in everything that happened yesterday. But if it happened last week, uh, there's certainly some stuff I'm going to be interested in that happened last week, but what about what happened three months ago? Maybe I don't care about half of it. Certainly some stuff I'm going to be interested in, but I certainly don't need everything 
I don't need to know everything that happened three months ago. Some of this data, all data has a shelf life. And think about expiring and not keeping everything forever because that's untenable. Some stuff we want to keep for longer than others. Otherwise, nah, certainly in the case of threat hunting, we probably don't care. We probably don't care what happened five years ago. At most, we might care what happened last year. Three months, possibly, today, absolutely, yesterday, very, very much. And if I leave you with just one idea, just one thought, if you really, really want to do threat hunting, it's all about empowering people to hunt threats. Very, very simple. Thank you, Martin and Simon.